Whatever gain I had, these I have come to regard as lost because of Christ. That is what the Apostle Paul tells us in the first reading. And if we ask ourselves, what were those things that he no longer considered important in his life and was not even content to lose in order to find Christ? We realize that they were not material realities, but a wealth of religious riches. Paul was devout and zealous, just and dutiful. Yet this very religiosity, which could have seemed a source of pride and merit, proved to be an impediment. Paul goes on to say, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. People who are extremely rich in their own minds and proud of their religious accomplishments consider themselves better than others. They feel satisfied that they cut a good figure. And this happens a lot in our parishes. You know, I do this and I do that. I help the priest. I do, I take collection. It's always I, 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 myself. How often this happens when we think that we are better than others? These people, they feel comfortable, but they have no room for God because they feel no need for him. And many times, many, many times, Catholics, even themselves, they feel justified because they go to the parish, they go to church, because they go to Mass every Sunday, and they start boasting of being the just ones. I don't belong, I don't need anything because I go to Mass. What happens there is that the place of God is now taken by I. I become the center of everything. Even if they do prayers and do all these things, it's no longer for God. It's just, it's no longer a dialogue with God, it's no longer a prayer. It is for this reason that the scripture reminds us that it is only the prayer of the humble which pierces the heart of God. Because only those who are poor in spirit and conscious of their need of salvation and forgiveness come into the presence of God, they come before him without boasting about their merits, without pretense or presumption, because they possess nothing. They find everything because they find the Lord. Jesus offers us this teaching in the parable that we have just heard. It is the story of two men, a Pharisee and a tax collector, who both go to the temple to pray, but only one reaches the heart of God. Even before they do anything, their physical attitude is eloquent. The Gospel tells us that the Pharisee prayed, standing by himself, while the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven. He is ashamed. Let us reflect a moment on these attitudes. The Pharisee stood by himself, he is secure of himself standing proudly erect, like someone to be respected for his accomplishment. With this attitude he prays to God, but in fact he celebrates himself. I go to the temple, I observe the law, I give alms. It's always me, 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 and for me, and me, me, me. Formally, his prayer is perfect. Publicly, he appears pious and devout. But instead of opening his heart to God, he masks his weaknesses in hypocrisy. Many times, 
We do the same. We put a mask and make up in our own lives. This Pharisee does not await the Lord's salvation as a free gift, but practically demands it as a reward for his merits. I've done my homework, I've done what I was supposed to do, then give me my reward. And therefore he strides up to the altar of God and takes his place in the front row. But he ends by going too far. And puts himself before God. Once again, me, myself, I. Where is the other one? The text collector, on the other hand, stand far off. He doesn't push himself to the front, he stays at the back. Yet that distance which expresses his sinfulness before the holiness of God enables him to experience the loving and merciful embrace of the Father. God could come to him precisely because, by standing far off, he had made room for him. He had made room for God. He doesn't just speak about himself. He speaks asking for forgiveness. He looks at God and he asks for forgiveness. How true this is also with regard to our relationships in our families, in society, and likewise in the church. True, true dialogue takes place when we are able to preserve a certain space between ourselves and others, a healthy space that allows each to breathe without being sucked in or overwhelmed. Only then can dialogue and encounter bridge the distance and create closeness. That happens in the life of the tax collector standing at the back of the temple. He recognizes the truth of how he stands before God. Far off and in this way making it possible for God to draw near to him. Fratelli e sorelle, ricordiamoci questo. Il Signore viene a noi quando prendiamo le distanze. Brothers and sisters, let us remember this. The Lord comes to us when we step back from our presumptuous ego. Io sono presuntuoso. We ask ourselves, am I presumptuous? Migliore degli altri. Do I believe that I'm better than others? Io guardo qualcuno così. Do I look at other people? Do I look down on other people and say, I thank you, Lord, because you have saved me, because I'm not like all these other people who don't understand anything? I go to church. I go to Mass. I am married, married in the church, and these ones, they're all divorced and they're sinners. Is your heart like that? You will go to hell, eh? Coming closer to God, it says, Lord, and say to him, Lord, I am a sinner. In a way that, Lord, I haven't fallen in the deepest hell because your mercy has saved me. This is our attitude, to say, thank you, Lord, because I'm what I am, thanks to you. Because I can say, thank you, Lord, because I haven't been distracted, I haven't destroyed myself by sin. God can preach the distance whenever, with honesty and sincerity, we bring ourselves, our weaknesses before him. He holds out his hand and he lifts us up. Whenever we realize we are hitting rot bottom and we turn back to him with a sincere heart. That is how God is. He is waiting for us deep down, for in Jesus he chose to descend to the depths, to take the lowliest place and to make himself the servant of all. He is waiting for us down there because he is unafraid to descend even to our inner abysses, to touch the wounds of our flesh, to embrace our poverty, our failures in life and the mistakes we make through weakness and negligence. God awaits us when with humility we go and ask for forgiveness in the sacrament of confession. God awaits us there. 
Brothers and sisters, today let us make an examination of conscience. Because the Pharisee and the tax collector both dwell deep within us. Let us not hide behind the hypocrisy of appearances, but entrust to the Lord's mercy our darkness, our mistakes. Let us think of our mistakes, our wretchedness. The wretchedness that sometimes we are not even able to share with one another. It's okay. God understands. When we go to confession, we stand far off at the back like the publican in order to acknowledge the distance between God's dream for our lives and the, the reality of who we are each day. Poor sinners. At that moment, the Lord draws near to us. He brings the distance and sets us back on our feet. At that moment, when we realize that we are naked, He clothes us with the festal garment. That is, and that must be, the meaning of the Sacrament of Reconciliation, a festal encounter that heals the heart and leaves us with inner peace not a human tribunal to approach with dread, but a divine embrace in which to find consolation. One of the most beautiful things is the tenderness of God. It's like just being embraced in God's hands in such a way that we can't even talk. We are so taken by His love and His tenderness. My brothers and sisters, I invite you to learn to forgive. Forgive everything, forgive everyone without putting anything in your consciences. Let people say whatever they have to say. You be like Jesus, have that tenderness and that silence in your hearts. Once again, I remind you that the sacrament of confession is not torture. It's there to give peace. I invite you, therefore, dear priest, to forgive everything like God has forgiven everything. Uh, from you, has forgiven you everything. In this season of Lent with contrite hearts, let us quietly say like the text collector, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Let us repeat it. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Dio, abbi pietà di me, when I forget you or I neglect you, when I prefer my words and those of the world to your own word, when I presume to be righteous and look down on others, when I gossip about others, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. When I care nothing for those all around me, when I'm indifferent to the poor and the suffering, the weak and the out. For my sins against life, for my bad example, that stains the lovely face of Mother Church, for my sins against creation, O oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. For my hidden sins, for my ways in which I have unconsciously wronged others. For my hidden sins, for the ways in which I have unconsciously wronged others, and for the good I could have done and yet failed to do, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. In silencio, ripetiamo per qualche instante col cuore pentito e fiducioso. O Dio, abbi pietà di me, peccatore. In silencio, ognuno lo ripete nel suo cuore. And silently we try and repeat these words in our hearts. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. We take a moment and we repeat these words in our hearts. O 
Oh Dio, abbi pietà di me, peccatore. In questo atto di pentimento, di fiducia, ci apriremo alla God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And in this act 